Um, we will refer to gauges. Um, I kind of put this up here to make people remind them of what gauge they may have or what they're using. Most of the stuff that I have as illustrations today will be focusing on the DM32, uh, but they can apply to any of these gauges, or I can try and answer some of your questions that relate to other gauges. So the DG700 Energy Conservatory, the older DM2, or the new DM32. These are some of the goals I tried to accomplish today. So if the rest, if you're going to be here with us for the next five hours, I'm sure I can complete these tasks. But um, my goal is to try and get out of here in less than an hour. So um, some of them I may move through kind of quickly, and uh, I leave it up to you to uh, throw your questions out and uh, uh, make sure I cover the issues if I did not uh, address them directly. All right, good to see um, a few other people. From, uh, Larry's from uh, Atlanta also, and a few f uh, folks from Illinois, and uh, Little Rock. That's great. I appreciate your uh, feedback. Uh, Jay and I really enjoy when we have an interactive group that uh, kind of gives us some information to play off of. Um, I'm going to start with the single point blower door test and what is uh, different about California. And many of you that are HERS raters will feel this may be similar to the uh, multi point or the single point in a variety of ways, but uh, usually as California does things, many times they also uh, affect uh, how the HERS rating goes in general. Um, there's a lot of things that go into energy code um, from California that are way too in-depth to handle from other uh, aspects, from refrigerant charge to uh, who can do what and when, and a variety of aspects. So those are not actually able to be conquered today. My focus is on some of the testing procedures, uh, some of which like the the flow of the uh, of the air handler, I thought were pretty interesting and definitely want to cover some of those today. So the single point blower door tests, and I tried to make sure everybody was on the same page when we talk about single point uh, versus the multi-point. So this is really just one reading from one test pressure, typically at a pressure difference of 50 pascals, versus a multi-point test, which are uh, multiple readings uh, and or test pressure. So you're definitely going to have multiple test pressures as part of that, maybe that didn't read as well as I wanted it to. And um, many times there's going to be multiple readings at each pressure. So if you're going to be, have eight readings from 15 to 60, then many times the software, which is what usually controls this type of test, is automatically programmed to do multiple readings at 15 pascals and multiple readings all the way up to 60. So it isn't just one reading at 15 and one reading you know, at 22 and so on. So there really is uh, a design that has multiple readings at a certain time average to give me these types of results. So we're just making sure we're all on the same page between a uh, single point and the multi-point. Uh, the single point has a few criteria that uh, trying to determine its accuracy uh, right out of the gate. So you need to record indoor and outdoor temperatures, uh, telling you to an accuracy of five uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And for building sites, you need to keep track of it's above 5,000 uh, feet in elevation and record elevation within 1,000 feet. So it's pretty easy to find out from Google Maps or a variety of services what your elevation is. And most of the country is below 5,000 feet. So if you're above 5,000, I'd be great to hear uh, from you or if you're at one of those areas. I do know that you know, Colorado has many of those aspects. There's a few other places that actually go above 5,000. But um, of the 50 states, I think um, maybe only 13, 15 or so actually have cities that actually uh, go be, uh, above that. So you're going to choose a time average period of at least 10 seconds. It can be longer. The longer your uh, average is, of course, your accuracy will also improve. And your you start off with your blower door seal. So now I'm going to talk about the um, uh, the two different types of baseline readings that we need to do in order to uh, comply with this. So I'm going to take five independent uh, measurements of baselines, all right? And the, I'm going to average baseline readings uh, based upon how they uh, come into play. So here's the two different types of baselines that we're going to do. The first one is to determine the level of accuracy. And what that does is actually give me a baseline range. So I'm going to subtract the smallest number of my five from the highest number. And that determines if I'm able to stay in what, as many of you may be familiar with, the standard level of accuracy, baseline range less than five. Okay, so five puts me in the category of a reduced level of accuracy. 
and that would be between five and uh, less than 10 actually is kind of the, the general. So if I'm at 10, I actually am no longer able to do a single point lower door test. So I put together a few things. So for many people that have the DM32, if you're doing blower doors, you would uh, be familiar with how to do a baseline. But just to make sure we cover that, for those of you that do not have a gauge, uh, so uh, I do have one question that covers that. So what type of gauge do you use? I'll launch one more quick poll. Uh, you should be able to maybe do uh, multiple. So the DM32 uh, is the one you see on your screen. The DM2 is the other uh, older Retrotech manometer. The DG700 is the Energy Conservatory, and if you have something else that you use um, for your testing, uh, some people use uh, Testo or other stuff to do uh, maybe evaluations inside the home. So if you let me know what you got, that would be great. All right, uh, let's we'll do a few more seconds. Your voting um, uh, response has been phenomenal. We're uh, over almost 85 here. I'm going to close this out. That's less than 40 seconds. That's great, everybody. And let's see who uh, out here with the gauges. So uh, we have a fair amount of people that have the new DM32. Um, those of you that have the DM2 and uh, DG700 are about the same. Uh, I will make a note that um, Retrotech does have an uh, upgrade program where you can trade in your DM2 or your DG700 and upgrade to the new DM32. And uh, I don't do price sheets or keep track of that. I do know that the new year, the upgrade program, Price is probably going to change. So if you're interested to find out uh, what a great deal it is, I can tell you that it is a phenomenal uh, reduction in the cost if you want to uh, move into the new gauge. So sales at retrotech.com will get you started. And uh, after January, I'm sure the price will no longer be the uh, the price you'll get quoted to this uh, in December. All right, let's hide those. All right, so on the baseline, we're going to hit settings. We go to the next page, and it tells me there's none taken so far, and I can now just do uh, press the baseline. I can capture a baseline, and it's now going to be uh, at the bottom giving me a count, how many seconds has gone by. This is not really a live actual gauge, but an idea about how to, uh, it's done on the DM32, and I hit end capture, and then it actually captures the baseline. I need to have five baselines in order to do the single point uh, test in order to determine the accuracy level. So what I can actually do is just uh, clear that one and capture again and write those numbers down. A at this time, the gauge does not keep track of your uh, five baselines. Um, I know that that's a common request for many people, and I know that's on the hit list for Retrotech in the future. Uh, there is software that's coming out that will actually be able to handle all this automatically. So I can go through and uh, keep track of the five and write them down. And so, again, I can uh, end capture and, and acquire one. And what is the feature here is that at the end, I'm actually going to end up with a final baseline. And I can actually use that one as part of the test procedure. And I'll go through what those options are for you. All right. So I, uh, the last baseline I had, which was the fifth one, I wrote it down. It was 2.8. Um, and then I can actually use that uh, to do the actual test itself. So you can do a single point test if the mat you must get to at least uh, uh, 15 pascals, which we know most newer structures should not have a challenge with that. But sometimes a HERS rating um, or uh, additions in the home may uh, be challenged to actually get to 15 pascals. So that's the requirement. You must get to at least 15 um, as part of your test pressure. If you can't get to 50, you have to at least be able to get to 15. And the induced building pressure must be greater than four times the baseline. Uh, so I try to put down a few examples of how that kind of plays in. So if the baseline range, again, from the highest to the lowest was uh, 4.5, it was less than 5, then my test pressure must be a minimum of 18. And that actually completes the – I'm at the standard level of accuracy. That's very normal, and I can um, do the test uh, fairly quickly. If the baseline range is 6.8, then the test pressure, again, has to be 24. But I'm at a reduced level of accuracy because I'm above uh, 5. Um, and if actually if I'm more of a range between my highest and lowest baseline, 11.8, I cannot even do a single point test 
um, what they say in California is it's usually beautiful here. Just come back another day uh, because you're clearly in a, a day of bad wind and a bad storm. So here's my example of some baseline ranges. So I did each one is a 10 second average. Um, so I can actually just watch the little clock on the bottom of the manometer until it glows up to 10 seconds. And then I can uh, write that number down, uh, end and start all over. So uh, I have uh, one negative and it could be a variety of positives or negatives. I just threw some numbers together. So what I now need to do is then uh, find the highest and the lowest and subtract them and, just, and determine if that highest and lowest range is less than five. And if it is, then I'm on the standard level of accuracy. I do not have to do any other additional calculations uh, besides temperature or altitude. If for some reason my numbers were uh, slightly above, equal to five or above that, then there's other calculations that I need to do in order to uh, confirm uh, how to get my final uh, uh, CFM number. So here I had a, a 2.6, a negative 2.6, and a positive 2.8, which sometimes may not seem that too extreme um, when you're actually out in the field. Um, but that actually would be too high and, and put me at a reduced level of accuracy. You can take as many baseline a series of readings as you need to. So if you didn't like these five, then you could uh, drop one and, and move on to another one. Your goal is to try and have five baselines in a row that you're actually able to document and uh, use for your test procedure. Um, I know many people ask um, if there was a um, uh, why people would do it or not do it. So I'm not even going to really go into, into the depth about that. So um, so Alan asked about slides would be better. I'm not sure what uh, what you're asking there, Alan. So um, I have the option of using my last baseline that I did as part of the test, or I could actually average the baselines and use that, but it's actually hard to enter that. Neither gauge actually allows you to just enter a baseline. Um, or I can remeasure if I needed to one more time if I didn't keep it in the gauge. Then I can actually just go to one more baseline, again, the 10-second average, and, um, and and use that. So there is a method of actually testing without a baseline in the gauge and then applying that. It's a little more complicated and more challenging because you need to uh, get the gauge to convert the pressures into the CFM results. So uh, again, that's one method. The other method is to actually just use the gauge features. So you can use the at 50 interpreted results, and you can also use the baseline auto interpretation um, in order to actually use a baseline into the gauge itself. So this is the common things that most people are doing already. You just needed to find out is if I did a series of baselines, was I still in a standard or reduced accuracy um, range to do that? So if you are above 5,000 um, uh, feet in elevation, there is a factor in order to uh, multiply um, that by. So if I have my final CFM number, I'm going to multiply this number by it. Uh, or if for some reason the temperature from outside and inside was more than 30 degrees, there's a table for temperatures for a correction factor. So I can find my outside temperature on the uh, left going uh, vertical and at the top is the inside temperature, and then I can find the uh, correction factor uh, to use that. So uh, the example I have here is if I was at a place that had a higher elevation and um, did actually have a correction factor for temperature, here's how it would actually calculate itself. So the in order to get my corrected CFM 50, and uh, the answer there is on the left, which we're going to calculate out, is the nominal CFM50 is really what most people refer to as your typical results from my blower door, that I already have a uh, baseline that was incorporated, and I could have used the add feature. So all that is my final CFM number. So for here, I just use the number 1150 as the nominal results. And if I had a altitude, let's say that I was at a um, 5,500 um, elevation and I had a temperature and I used my uh, scale on my table on the previous um, uh, slide, 
then here's how they all kind of uh, move out together. So if I was at um, uh, elevation of uh, uh, 5,500, I have a, a factor of uh, 1.033 uh, times that uh, 1150, and there's a temperature correction. And my final corrected CFM 50 is 1231. So that's actually the number that I would have, and that's my final result with a standard level of accuracy as, as the test procedure. So hopefully I did not put anybody to sleep or um, I still have people attending the uh, webinar. Um, so if it is reduced level, let's say that my baseline, it was kind of a windy day and I did actually have uh, baselines that came between five or less than 10, then I actually now need to use a correction on the reduced level of accuracy that happens with that. So um, the calculation that shows up on that is, um, you know, one plus this 0.1 of you know, 50 divided by my number. So I kind of threw the math out there so you can see how that plays out, that uh, ultimately I end up with a correction factor of uh, 1.141 times my um, uh, corrected altitude and temperature um, CFM, and I finally have a, a final version or final number of 1405 CFM at 50 pascals. So hopefully that kind of made sense as to what the, the process was. Um, it's not as complicated as many people were making it out to be. Um, it's mostly just trying to determine if you're at a certain level of accuracy um, and willing to admit it, uh, to be honest. Oh, I may have had a repeated slide here. So um, sorry, sometimes I'll duplicate a slide to do something else with the next one. Uh, the multi-point test, there's not a lot that I go into that's similar to the single-point test because it is a much more complicated uh, process in terms of uh, how many individual readings get done at each individual point uh, or pressures that you're actually testing. So in general, it follows the ASTM 779 test and is done uh, by automatic software. So Energy Conservatory and Retrotech both have automated software and um, that's usually how you're going to perform a multi-point test. I don't really think it's uh, – I'm sure that you could do one manually, but um, it would be very, very complicated. And there is a light version. It's a free version, uh, fantastic, that's available at the Retrotech site to download. Uh, it does one fan and uh, can do uh, this test exactly as you kind of see. Um, you can add your, your pictures and uh, run the test automatically. It will find the gauge and you hit run and it goes through um, the series of tests. The 779 typically requires a pressurization and depressurization, but you can just do one or the other. So um, it does allow for just doing a standard depressurization test in the software that's very similar to the multi-point test you'd have to do for this. Um, if you want to upgrade um, and to do multiple fans, um, and get custom reports, then they have a price structure that goes from uh, two to six to a variety of different fans. And again, you can contact sales if you really are interested in uh, upgrading the free version of Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to try to explain the Energy Conservatory TrueFlow grid and how that works. Um, I'm going to use the, um, the process in general. And I also use the, uh, the DM32 as the gauge of the example. So um, this is the Energy Conservatory, um, you know, their proprietary uh, true flow grid. Um, it's a great way to measure uh, total system flow. Uh, it's a requirement for Title 24 that you must determine the CFM flow through the system itself. And there's uh, multiple ways that this can be accomplished, uh, one of which is to use the true flow grid. Um, so one of the things that you're going to do is you're going to – I have some pictures, and I'll explain. Um, you'll see the pictures on how they actually come together with an illustration. I was not able to get as many automations done in the slides I needed to, but uh, I think we can explain the process. So you can see the image here, and I have other illustrations that talk about how the DM32 gets connected to their uh, the TrueFlow grid. You can put the TrueFlow grid uh, at the air handler or you can put it where the return is when you have a single return. If you have multiple returns, then you have to actually, um, let's say if I have a, a system like my house has a return in every room, 
then I have to actually use the uh, air handler as a source. If there's two returns, then I really should be measuring both of them if I want to measure at the actual um, uh, uh, place outside of the, the unit itself. So I can measure at the air handler, or I can measure where the return actually comes to the uh, inside of the house. All right. Um, some of my um, uh, things at the top weren't get, didn't get cleaned up. So your first thing we're going to do is we're going to establish um, how to pick the device. So I go to RetroTech the, on the gauge. I go to the devices. Um, these are all of the energy conservatory devices. Uh, the true flow grid is at the bottom uh, right. Uh, you must make sure you pick between the, the smaller 14 or the 20. And then my gauge is set up to actually be able to use that as the device, just as you might use it for a blower door or duct tester or any other device. That's uh, basically how the, the system works for the, that gauge. I guess here's a much better illustration. So this is actually using a single return. It's a lot easier to demonstrate the illustration. So the filter stays in place. Um, this test was designed to actually uh, know what the, the normal operating system pressure is with the real filter in it. So if you're doing an existing home or sometimes they actually have a, a series of, um, you know, uh, existing construction or, and you show up and the filter is incredibly dirty, then you must use the fil dirty filter or you must replace it with one that would normally be used for that system. Uh, but you cannot determine your normal operating system pressure uh, with this by just taking a dirty filter out. You're, you know, it's not actually an accurate test. So based on this uh, system where I actually have the air handler on, you, you really should try and use the cooling mode whenever possible so that I get the most airflow that's happening in the system. There's more airflow in the cooling mode than there is in the heating system. Um, there are a variety of ways to, uh, to deal with that. Um, I probably don't have enough time today to go through some of those options. I can tell you that you want to make sure that um, things are, if you have multiple zone systems, that – all that is able to be functioning and working um, when you're there to do your tests, because if not, it actually will be a challenge to uh, to complete your uh, your full diagnostics. So I did this uh, this one here, and I actually have a, a pressure, static pressure of normal operating pressure of 84 uh, pascals. So that's what the system runs normally. And now what I can actually do is uh, put the true flow grid in. I can either put it in where the return is. Uh, or I can put it in where the um, uh, at the air handler itself, and there is a, sp a specific way that it actually goes in. Uh, the flow only goes one way through the the unit. Um, the side that's got the uh, the additional uh, black tubing in it should be the side that the air is flowing into. So once I have that up, and you can see that I tried to use the actual uh, color coding system that comes with uh, the true flow grid that they actually have a red and a green tube that's actually already connected to their device and that's how it actually gets connected to the uh, the, uh, the dm32 um, the easy way to remember it is that on the channel b it has a green and a yellow and green does not go to green that's the only that helps me keep track of that it's it's the opposite of what it should be so green is not green is the method that uh, is used by many people. And uh, when I was out in California, Todd makes that his practice. And um, so here I have uh, the ability to actually now read the grid, depending on where it's at. It's the same uh, same process. And what I can do now is actually the reading on the gauge that I have as an example is not uh, uh, correct because my pressure will be higher. But I now need to find out what it is that um, – the test would be because actually now the grid actually has a reduction in terms of the flow that moves through the system. So I'm trying to find out is um, when I put in the, the true flow grid, what does it actually do to the um, uh, reading of the pressures that move through? Because it's no longer normal operating uh, conditions uh, because now I've actually introduced the actual true flow grid. So I can now determine that my initial uh, operating pressure was 84, and that's what I need to get back to in order to measure the flow that moves through it. One of the ways you can do that is actually on the gauge. Um, I can actually just do set pressure uh, 84 and use the add feature to actually give me the actual CFMs that would be moving through this true flow grid um, at 
the normal operating pressure of 84 pascals. So it's kind of like um, there is no device for it to actually control or uh, go to that pressure, but it allows the gauge to give me an at pressure of any number that I actually want. So I would enter set pressure, 84, and you can see at the bottom it says seeking 84 pascals. And now I actually get to reading uh, the CFM based upon 84 pascals, which was the normal operating pressure. Here I have the example of if you have multiple returns, you know, just two or sometimes there's a second one in the master bedroom and a main one in the hallway that I really should have a, a flow grid in each one of them. I don't have to measure them at the same time, but I need to be able to measure them uh, one after the other. And uh, if it becomes more challenging to do that, then the real solution is to actually use the true flow grid at the air handler. Uh, you can, I believe you can use the DM2. I was expecting that question uh, today, Dan, and I um, I used to be very, uh, you know, in depth with the DM2. Uh, I believe it is on there as um, a device to do that. And that actually, the DM2 is a lot easier to actually do the set pressure because I can actually, in the settings uh, mode, determine what the add pressure could be, and I can set that at any uh, number I want to. So uh, I'm sure that actually can be done on the DM2 just as well. I'm going to try and catch a couple of questions here to make sure I don't move past uh, while we're on the same topic. So um, the question is, is the, syst is the filter removed from the system? And it depends on um, when and where you might be doing that. So let's say that I uh, – I'll go back to the previous slide, and uh, I'm going to put it here in the air handler. So here I will actually have the uh, filter removed, all right? So at that point, you'll see a, a difference between having the filter versus the true flow grid uh, in place. Um, and that's why I want to make sure that I'm back to the, the normal system uh, operating pressure. Um, but in a system like this where the filter is at the air handler, the filter would stay there. And you may find that there's not much of a difference from the – true flow grid, but there is some just enough because you're uh, actually uh, inserting something that's different from the normal flow. So now that I have a true flow grid in place, there should be some flow reduction. So I need to make sure that I'm back to the, the normal operating system pressure. So it's not as drastic as removing the filter and seeing a difference, but uh, there should be some uh, static pressure difference that I need to actually overcome. All right. Any uh, other questions about the uh, true flow grid? Um, so I'm going to move on to our next. I did not get to animate these like I wanted to, but I want to move on to some other topics uh, that I think are pretty interesting that they're doing. One of the ways, again, all this is trying to measure the uh, total system flow. And uh, California requires this. And as many of us know, that it doesn't take long before California does something and other people feel like, wow, that was a pretty good idea. And it gets uh, integrated into other things that we also do on our normal uh, process. So this is actually doing a um, – uh, using the plenum pressure like we just had a second ago in the, using the true flow grid. And I'm now going to recreate a flow that moves through the system and rematch that, um, that pressure that's on there. Uh, someone says, if the if the filter remains, do we care about the um, standard operating pressure? And you, you do, and that's actually technically uh, yes, um, but you're going to find out that it's not a drastic difference of what the flow grid reduces. So, But it, it is some. So for you, a lot of the stuff is like technically this is how you do it, and you'll find out that maybe it's a very small – a difference, but um, yes, there is actually a you know, standard operation pressure, and that's what I need to match. Um, and it may not be very uh, far off because the filters are already in place. So the plenum pressure matching um, and fan flow meter, all right. And so this is uh, step one, right? So I get the um, uh, the uh, what they call the static pressure in the supply plenum, the, the PSP. 
All right. Everything has its own simple acronym. So um, norm, the other one was normal operating um, standard pressure. So this is their static pressure um, that's for normal operation. All right. They call it the PSP. All right. So I have that. All right. And then phase two is um, the filter is now removed. And the grill is taking off if you're going to do this down in the actual um, uh, house itself. You can do it at the unit, but um, uh, what makes this more convenient is that I have a static pressure probe up at the unit uh, in the air, uh, the air handler, uh, typically in the attic. Um, and now I actually am able to use my duct tester or my blower door to actually now uh, induce pressure to match and regain that pressure that's in there. So they want you to eliminate any other obstacles um, in order to measure the flow that really goes through the system. Um, so their uh, technical standards require you to remove the filter and the grill as best you can to then install your blower door or duct tester. You can see the picture in the bottom right on what that might look like. If there are other returns, you're allowed to seal them in order to measure the flow that's moving basically through the system from your main return. So I wouldn't want to use a small return. I'd want to use the, the largest return and move air through. So now what I'm trying to do is actually use the blower door or the, the duct tester. Many times the duct testers are, do not move enough air um, to do that. And there is actually a correction factor to do that. If you only have a duct tester, it can be done, and it's a way of extrapolating where your curve is headed. Um, so once I have the same pressure back in the plenum, um, and at this point, I wouldn't be using the um, controller, uh, the manometer to control the fan. I would just actually use the speed control that's on the fan itself. It's much more sensitive and easier to uh, move up and down for slight pressures. Um, so I could actually uh, use the fan to control the pressure that moves through. Once my uh, PSP static pressure was the same, then I actually get a system flow rate on the uh, out of the gauge itself. Um, so it is reading the, the fan, uh, but I, I wouldn't use it to actually control it um, in terms of the, the flow that moved through that. Okay, so there's um, this is using the same plenum pressure matching um, uh, process, all right? Uh, and this is actually testing at the air handler um, in unconditioned space. So if I'm going to actually um, take my duct tester or my blower door uh, flex, I can actually, you know, maybe leave the fan down uh, in the interior, but actually still connect it to the air handler, right? So um, at this point, I'm again, I got my static pressure. Um, established uh, and you need to now make sure you have some kind of um, open door or access that's connecting your unconditioned and conditioned space in order to perform this test all right so again the filters removed all right my flex is now actually at the unit itself um, and i can actually now separate the return i don't need i'm not using the return i'm actually at the air handler so i uh, it's even uh, obviously best to just block it off at the air handler because um, I don't really want air coming back uh, towards the return. Um, but if I had to, I would have to like cover those off. But the goal is to get the best flow that's actually happening through the air handler, through the supply. And uh, so if I'm going to do this method, I need to make sure, again, I have a connection from unconditioned to conditioned space. And again, I'm just going to do a pressure matching with the actual static pressure uh, that's actually in the, uh, the, the plenum itself. All right, so somebody said about how to use the blower door um, for this total system flow. So I'm going to – I have one more thing that, that's very similar that I'll cover that kind of explains how that works, Dan. Um, uh, which one is most accurate? What a great question, Mike. Um, you know, we were out there. We actually had a, a house that we were testing while I was there, and they have a nice test house, which is a very uh, real uh, type house that we did. Um, and – the question is that how do I know really – and there is actually a CFM that it should be moving. In fact, if you really want to – the most accurate would be to actually what is the um, the uh, static pressure that should be moving through the system is really what most people are asking for to kind of confirm that it's uh, 
working correctly. But at this point, they're just trying to determine the CFM. So uh, some methods we used were like very close to each other. Uh, other methods may have been off by uh, as much as 100 CFM. So I couldn't determine which one was considered the accurate one. Um, and at this process, it's more like uh, California's trying to overcome their their new code and the methods of actually testing to go through this. So uh, right now, a lot of people are kind of uh, challenged, confused, or frustrated. Uh, but I think it'll all kind of uh, work itself out as to what their goal was to find out that the system is working correctly or moving enough air that it should be getting to where it's supposed to go. So this is, again, all about matching the pressure that we have in the plenum uh, and using your duct tester or blower door to do that. All right, so this may answer your question you had, uh, uh, Dan, about how this kind of can work. Um, so I have an exhaust fan here, or it could just be any system that we're trying to move air through. So what happens is that um, once I have uh, – uh, Air that's moving through. So instead of it being the exhaust fan on the example here, maybe it's actually the, the air handler that's now pulling air through. So we're going to actually now use the duct tester or the blower door as actually a powered uh, flow hood to want to match the pressures that are moving through it. Uh, you can use this to actually measure an exhaust fan uh, in your bathroom, your kitchen. Uh, it's one way to actually do a fairly accurate way of uh, testing any kind of um, fan flow in general. So once I actually have the the device I want to measure is on, it's now pulling air through my fan. And it usually will create a negative pressure based upon this setup that I have here. All right, so somewhere in the middle of the section that's not really directly in the flow, but I'm going to now measure the pressure that's inside the uh, either there's a box here that I have or inside the flex. And now I'm going to try and uh, get the fan to go to where zero is. Once I have the same amount of air that's moving with the fan on, the, the, the test fan, blower door or duct tester, once that's matching the same amount of flow and I have zero pressure, then it must be giving me the same CFM, which means that the blower door or duct tester has the same air moving it's matching the same air that actually is being pulled through it initially. Uh, here's another kind of illustration that may uh, also make it simple. So I have my uh, yellow uh, connection to the fan because that's always going to read the CFM. And I have a blue uh, tube. Your goal is to make sure that the tube is not in the flow because it will affect your, uh, your readings. So some of the methods that – if you're going to use a blower door to do this, they have large um, uh, boxes. Um, Russ King of Sierra um, Design out there, he actually has these devices, which he's working on, a few prototypes. I'm sure they'll be available by the end of the year that allow you to do this type of test methods with a large air handler um, and able to get these kind of pressures. So my goal is reading pressures between the blower door duct tester and the air that's being pulled through it. Once I get to zero, I've been able to match the actual uh, flow, and now I actually have a reading. So this is kind of how it actually um, plays out when you're trying to do a um, – in most cases, you probably would use a, a blower door to match some of the actual uh, flow that has to happen with these type of systems. So the powered flow capture hood or the PFCH, right? Um, again, the air handler is on. There will be a negative pressure that's created because it's pulling air now through the duct tester blower door. And um, then my goal is to turn the fan on. Once I get to zero inside the uh, pressure, then I actually have a flow reading that shows up. So um, this is the same uh, process. So if I only have one – um, I, it, it, there's a mess of it. Dirty filter is not removed. It stays there. So that was my bad. Um, so this is the same system that you would have if I had a single return. And it could actually be done on um, uh, multiple returns. This is kind of more of a uh, extreme. But if I had two of them, I could actually do the same process of uh, measure um, this uh, return and measure uh, that return to try and get a flow. So 
Um, this method, um, I must be up front. I've, I need to confirm. I forgot to uh, ask somebody at CalSearch if this method is uh, acceptable. I don't know why it wouldn't be because my goal is if I had two returns, I could measure them the same way. Um, you can use a passive uh, a flow hood also as a measurement. I do not have a slide for that, but I can use a uh, one of the TSIs or the Olinor or a variety of different large uh, units to actually measure the flow from the returns and add them up. And that would also be my CFM reading. Uh, they do require uh, uh, testing exhaust fans. Uh, some people may catch this. I try and include this uh, a few times throughout the uh, the year. Uh, depends on what gauge you have or what device you have. Uh, this is the Energy Conservatory exhaust fan flow meter. Um, it's a in, in terms of doing just simple exhaust fans, and actually it's very accurate. Um, uh, uh, Retrotech also sells the. Uh, uh, a power flow hood, uh, which is incredibly light and also does um, supply. And we're trying to work with how to get California to accept that as a, uh, a test method also. Um, so I use the uh, uh, Retrotech DM32. And notice that uh, when you're using the Retrotech that I'm on a channel B because I want to read the CFM, but I'm not on the input. If you use the Minneapolis, you actually are on the input on channel B, but Retrotech reads their um, channel B differently in terms of how it actually converts its results, and they actually will read it on the reference. Uh, several people ask about the slides. Um, so what I'm trying to work on, uh, Karen and several other people, is that I've had s several other slides that I've done in the last couple of months, and I'm, we're trying to create a system where we can send out a PDF that has those. Um, I need to make sure I'm careful about what I send out or some of those things, but it is my goal to, in December, to create a library uh, and share those. So if anybody's been come to any of our webinars, uh, we'll send you a link uh, with how to uh, access those and uh, be able to have access to PDFs on those. Uh, there will be a video that shows up. Um, but it would help you to send me an, uh, an email, and that helps remind me of uh, people I want to make sure get those uh, get those slides. So here I can use the DM2, and the issue the issue here is that the DM2 doesn't do well with the uh, the internal uh, selection of the exhaust the exhaust fan flow meter, and so we recommend that you use the whole flow method that's actually in the, the DM2. It actually has a, a device that's called whole flow and it'll actually measure the opening that's here and you can enter that information and it'll give you a very accurate reading uh, using the exhaust fan flow meter. And the other option is you can use the energy conservatory and that's the setup uh, to based upon whichever um, gauge you might have um, in your arsenal. Uh, so here's how it's set up or here's how I actually use it is that um, you notice that I have the – I try and keep the color uh, selection together so you know where they're actually going on the, the DM2 and, uh, or the DM32. The same uh, ports are identical, that the, the yellow is going to the uh, reference on channel B. Um, but I also connected uh, the blue input because I can now see the pressures that are showing up on channel A. And it helps me confirm that I'm actually within the criteria that the test device requires, that I should be above above one and less than eight. Uh, I found the closer I am to two, that I get, you know, I, I feel very accurate about the readings. And um, now I actually can get both readings at the same time. So uh, even at the Energy Conservatory, it's a great way to confirm what your actual readings are. Um, another way you can do it is to use um, something that's homemade. You can also do a similar process with kitchen exhaust fans, which are a challenge to uh, uh, sometimes to measure because uh, certain devices don't fit well. So on the picture in the bottom here, I actually am using a duct tester as a powered flow hood um, that actually will measure the flow. It will match the pressure that uh, in order to do the kitchen exhaust fan. And I made a little device with an opening cut out in the middle. so. This uh, uh, microwave has two openings uh, in order to try and measure the fan, so it's not really the best way to recover one up. You want to try and get the total flow through the single opening and measure it like that. And uh, here's another uh, solution you also can use. So this is the um, uh, powered flow hood that Retrotech has, um, and it, this is really considered a gold standard device. 
Um, I know that uh, Berkeley Labs and many other people use this as what they actually compare uh, all the other uh, processes to in terms of measuring uh, uh, fans today. Uh, one last one I'll cover is um, you don't need to buy a device. You can actually use a cardboard box. And on the DM2 uh, and the DM32, it actually has a device that's called Whole Flow. And I can actually um, create, take a cardboard box. This is very useful if you have a, a, a kitchen exhaust fan that's much larger or say it's above an island. It's really hard to put any kind of device on there. Um, I can actually try and create a box um, around it and make sure that my um, input uh, port, which you see in the picture here, is off to the corner and not really getting a direct uh, flow across it. And I just enter the opening that I have on the bottom of the box. Uh, this example was not too good. This is maybe a two by two opening uh, for an exhaust fan. I would say you need a three by three or five by five or maybe larger for a, a kitchen exhaust. But I enter the, the opening and uh, it'll actually tell me how many CFM moves through that. So it's a nice little uh, a feature that's built into the gauge um, if you really want to determine the flow. All right, these guys are back. Um, there's the email. You, uh, I saw some of you caught it earlier about uh, how to get a hold of us. Um, yeah, I do. It is my goal to try and create a, a library that other people can use for uh, training, uh, Dan. And um, I'm also going to create a, um, a series of slides that you can also uh, alter yourself to create different things about the gauge uh, that you may want to do. So it'll be kind of a blank gauge, and you can move things around in PowerPoint to actually uh, put in some numbers or uh, things like that. Um, if any of you are using a DM32 or want to learn more about it, um, it has a free app that you can download for your PC. It's called Virtual Gauge. You can get it right from the homepage on retrotech.com, and uh, it completely simulates an entire gauge. I can actually uh, practice how to do the exhaust fan flow meter or how to do a duct tester or blower door and it actually creates um, simulated pressures inside the the app that makes you feel like you're actually doing a real test. It kind of fluctuates slightly, and uh, it's a great way to learn how to use the gauge and how to do other uh, tests in general. So if you want to learn more about the DM32, uh, you can download virtual gauge from the, the website, and it's a great way to uh, get ahead of the curve or see what you're into. All right, so I uh, try not to rush through, but I definitely want to cover all the slides. And uh, I got a few minutes left. Usually what we do is we try to make sure there wasn't something else that we didn't cover or didn't go through. Uh, I'll be honest, there was a series of slides that I did not get to about uh, how in, uh, California requires leakage to outside. Um, they only allow pressurization testing for duct leakage, period, whether it's a, uh, a total leakage or if you're going to do leakage outside, um, they only allow a pressurization test. Um, and one of the things that we recommend is try to take your duct tester and connect it to your outside reference like you do a blower door. And it allows you to actually uh, you know, do a test with them both going to 25 and not trying to get to zero. Uh, both methods are acceptable for California. Their leakage system is not based upon square footage. It's actually based upon uh, the size of the, the air conditioning uh, tonnage uh, or the amount of BTUs that the furnace is uh, designed for. So they have a criteria that your CFM leakage is actually based upon um, that type of criteria, not about square footage. Um, so that's one of the things I tried to get in there, and I did not. I apologize. I don't think I would have had time to complete it anyway. 